Okay, um, good morning everyone. Uh, we'll continue on with another panel, with a panel discussion on um, experiences from abroad that we can use to foster gender equality here in the Czech Republic. Uh, let me introduce our distinguished guests for this session. We have five of them, um, almost gender equal <laughs> here. Um, <laughs> we, have, we have Barbara. Um, C. Richardson, who is the ambassador of Canada to the Czech Republic. Thank you for, for joining us. Uh, we have another ambassador here, um, Alexander Grubmeier from Austria. Um, generally countries that are very good at fostering gender equality. That's why we use them for our experience here in Czech Republic. Um, we also have um, Professor Hilda Christensen um, from uh, University of Copenhagen uh, in Denmark, uh, who will give us the experience from the Nordic countries. Hopefully, uh, we have Fatim Diara from Helsinki. Sorry, from um, um, uh, who's a city councillor um, in Helsinki, and we also have Silvia Porubanova over there, uh, who can give us some idea or some experience from a country that's very similar to ours, um, also coming from more or less conservative uh, Central European background. So um, this should be it. At the first, we have five to six minutes presentations of uh, measures, one or two measures um, that we. Uh, that we can learn from here in the Czech Republic, that they are good, that were uh, well executed in these countries. And then um, we'll have some sort of general comments um, regarding the implementation of these measures to the Czech Republic. And then we should have like 10 to 15 minutes for discussion, for questions from the audience. So I first ask <laughs> Professor Christensen to come here and give us five, six, seven minutes about uh, about Denmark. Thank you very much. Okay. Hello, everybody, and um, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very impressed by your, the scope of your equality work. I wish we had the same scope in Denmark, but we can return back to that later on. Um, I have this challenging uh, assignment here to introduce you to Nordic gender equality policies and, and also the success of the Nordic countries in five minutes. So excuse me if I make some leaps because I have too many slides. I already know that. I'm an all-rounder, as you can see here. I'm specializing in various issues in gender studies, um, also in transport and gender mainstreaming of that. Perhaps we can return back to that. Um, we all know, and I can see from your reports, that you refer a lot to the Nordic countries. They are not the number ones or the number fives, fifth in all these uh, wonderful gender gap analysis or surveys. So my question here is, why are we so happy in the Nordic countries? So I'm really giving the positive history now and not all the problems. We can return back to them later on. We can start with women's suffrage, which, which many young students find a dull issue because, oh, the vote, but what does it matter? It matters. And the Nordic countries, they were pioneers in terms of uh, the uh, women's suffrage, as you can see. But by mistake, Denmark was, um, was um, grouped with the uh, Central European countries, which is not right. It was the students who set up uh, the map here. But you can see that this um, focus on women's representation has lasted and it's also visible in our, um, in our um, parliaments today. But when, what does it matter? Does it matter that women have the vote? Yes. A Danish uh, political scholar, he made this uh, estimation of if women, if there only were women voters in our country, how would the priorities, what would they look like? And you can see social reforms up, income transfers up, equality up, tax progression. So all the things that would also um, be fruitful for uh, furthering uh, gender equality. Then we have a long history, of course, and a less dramatic history, I would say, in the Nordic countries. And this might also matter a lot when we talk about progress and regress in this area. And I would uh, like to point to Alva and Gunnar Myrdal, who uh, probably some of you have uh, know about. They made a kind of social program in the 1930s as 
an answer to the economical crisis. And what they came up with in particular, Alva Myrdal, was a focus on women and employment and housing and childcare as um, connected areas. And uh, if we, uh, I mean, it's uh, an agenda of justice and growth. And I think that sometimes, if we should be self-critical, we forget about the growth agenda, which I think is very important also in current uh, European and probably also Eastern European, Central European uh, agendas. Next, we have this influential idea of a woman-friendly welfare state. Even though uh, if you ask people in the street in Copenhagen, they will prob would probably not know what it is, but it has become gradually a, a part of the DNA of the Nordic populations, uh, I would say. And what is a woman-friendly welfare state? It was spelled out by Helga Hernes, a Norwegian political scientist. I don't have time to go into all the details, but I mean, I have bolded parts. It's a state that would not force harder choices on women than on men. Women will continue to have children, uh, but they'll also be able to choose other roads. Women will not have to choose futures that demand greater sacrifices from them than from men. And it would uh, be a state where injustice, where women's equality would not be uh, attained on the cost of other women hiring them in as cheap domestic labor uh, and so on. Then, of course, we have the whole state feminist uh, agendas, which you also, you have a strong heritage, I think, of state feminism. We have talked a lot about state investments. The state should do more, but I think it still matters. But in, at the Nordic level, we have had this a state feminist spelled out as equality from above, but also from below, from the NGOs. And I think it's very important to keep this balance because otherwise you get a lot of, of uh, resistance. And then of course a lot of committees and stuff like that. But also, as you can see at the bottom level here, a flexible and dynamic idea of equality, difference, and diversity, which means that you have to develop your ideas and not to fix gender as either nature or constructions or whatever. You really need to do that. And I think that the Nordic models, to a certain degree, have been able to include also new uh, contested uh, ideas. Mobilizations, and I don't mean only mobilizations on the in the social media, but also in the streets. And we have had a couple of mobilizations recently in Denmark. We had the 100 years for the vote in 2015, where literally all communities, they participated from the very conservative to um, LGBT, etc. Uh, in these mobilizations. And we also recently had a public, or nearby public uh, strike uh, among public uh, servants, which make up 800,000 people in a population of 5 million in Denmark, many of them, many of whom are women and went to the streets. It was, it was really nice to see, and, and we also uh, achieved uh, something. So I think that these mobilizations, they are still very, very uh, important. We haven't had mobilizations for some years, but all of a sudden, there seemed to be uh, something uh, on the move. Also, uh, a very important issue is uh, the idea of citizenship. What is a good citizen? And at the Nordic level, we have this idea of participatory citizenship, meaning that you have uh, to contribute to the state to, to growth and prosperity and be a taxpayer. You need to have a job, but you also are and in return, you receive uh, social welfare and, uh, and also democratic rights. And these rights uh, are addressing both men and women and also nowadays migrants. And I think it's a very strong um, idea in a way to, to have this idea. And I don't know how the Czech uh, ideal citizen here look, but perhaps you could, uh, you could uh, <laughs> consider it. Um, yeah, as you see, there are also this passion for including men nowadays. 
in Denmark, uh, one good example is the provision of childcare. Denmark has the highest level of provision of childcare, not only for the two years up, but for the O to two year old. And you can see Denmark here, the light green. Uh, we like that to be on top because that's uh, one of the only areas where we are on top in, in, in the <laughs> equality uh, context. But uh, of course, uh, I travel a lot in China and people say, oh, what does it cost? It costs a lot. So you can see Denmark is also on top when it uh, regards uh, public investment in uh, childcare. And uh, I would say we have quality childcare in most places. And many parents today would say we don't have high quality, so they aim at high quality. But anyway, it's a right for every citizen, unaware of gender, uh, ethnicity, to put their kids uh, into these uh, public funded uh, childcare facilities. Then we have parental leave. It's also a Nordic pioneering uh, area. And you can see here the columns, Iceland, Finland, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. The blue uh, spots, they uh, concern the fathers. Uh, the greens uh, part, the both parents, and, and uh, the red uh, uh, is uh, um, showing the mother's part of, of the entire um, uh, parental leave or maternity leave. And as you can see, Iceland comes in as the number one here. They pioneered in the 1990s, where they said we put up uh, a shared, uh, facility, uh, shared provision here, and if the fathers don't take their third part uh, uh, of this, it will just disappear. And this model has been copied also in some of the other countries, but you can see that Denmark has st still this shared, you can choose, as our Prime Minister says, meaning that women, men only take 7% more of, of the two weeks they can, uh, that they have uh, in, in mandatory. Uh, so, and I heard in Czechoslovakia it's 2%, so here we are quite, quite close. So this is really a, a challenge. Okay, let's, there's uh, women on company boards. Norway is a good example. They rose their uh, percentage of women on boards in registered companies from 6%, I think, to 40% in 2009, and the pressure was that if they didn't uh, meet this um, uh, um, demand, they would be dissolved. Uh, and this was a very contested, very discussed, but at the end, you can see it ended with younger and better education, more mixed boards, more qualified boards, more diversity, uh, and also uh, with a broad support in society. Uh, then some people will say, what about the profits? Because that's interesting, of course. But as you can see, this coincided with the financial crisis. So I think there are mixed results, mixed uh, findings in research about the profits, but it, it, doesn't has to, it hasn't anything to do with uh, the boards. Then I have one final uh, example here, which is, um, addressing what the European Union holds uh, as a high priority now. Uh, uh, innovation, entrepreneurship, we have to compete at the global level. And many uh, women, I think they close their eyes and, oh, this is not for me, uh, it's for the men, I don't know what uh, innovation is. But I mean, we can rethink our, also <coughs> our everyday life. And I found uh, these examples of uh, user-driven uh, innovation. Uh, you probably know the walker, or rollator as it's called, um, and it was invented by a Swedish nurse in the 1950s, uh, 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 but she didn't patent it, so she, is not, uh, really, she disappeared out uh, of the history. She didn't earn a lot of money of, on it, which she could have done. And more lately, um, a Danish, um, nurse has invented this walker, 
worker worker, so you can be more active. And this is also part of the Nordic agenda. I think you have to be fit and individual and be able to move around. And it turns out that these workers, they are much more used, much more popular in Northern Europe compared to Southern Europe where people are more dependent on their families and stuff. But I think that one could try to think uh, in these, I mean also to think of possibilities for gender equality in these areas. Okay. Glass is full, half full or half empty. There is, of course, a flip side of this history. Uh, and I think we'll hear more about it from my, my <laughs> Finnish colleague. And then lessons to be learned, we'll probably return back to that. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. And forgive me if I cough. I have one of these horrible colds right now. Well, following somebody who is an academic and so schooled in this subject uh, is a little daunting. You could do the entire presentation today and it would be very helpful for all of us, I'm sure. Um, so let me just speak more anecdotally about um, the question that I was given, which was name two initiatives in your country that have had an impact on gender equality and so on. Very difficult. Uh, to name two, because there are so many. Um, but uh, when I thought about it, I'm going to talk about two or three things, aspects, um, that have been part of the movement in Canada. Um, it was very interesting for me to see the, uh, the slide, which was related to 1934 and sort of the, the feminist growth uh, project and so on. Um, meanwhile, back in Canada, um, we had just debated whether or not women were considered persons and as of 1929, the law decided that yes, we were. So we were a little bit slower, I think, than our Nordic friends to uh, come to this. Uh, then we moved forward to the 1980s, and we decided that we should probably um, have our own constitution, because up to that point, we did not. We were still using the British constitution as part of the Commonwealth, and this was revolutionary. Let's have our own constitution. Uh, you know, it's not that long ago, 1982, took us a while to grow up as a country. But the critical part of it, and I was out uh, mobilized, as the term is, and on the streets um, demonstrating about the aspect of the constitution that we felt was so important, which was this charter of rights and freedoms, which embedded into the constitution very specific language, which ensured the rights uh, for women. But there was a twist to it that was extremely important to us because we had a Bill of Rights and everybody was saying, well, you, you know, we've already fought that fight and everything is fine. And the Bill of Rights said that everyone has the right to equality before the law and the protection of the law uh, without discrimination because of many things, including sex. Good. Um, however, when we were fighting around the wording of the Charter, uh, it was important to us in the terms of the drafting that the guarantee to everyone was dropped to say every individual because by law corporations had started to say well if it's everybody then we're part of everybody that term so we have a right to equality so when women were coming before the courts to demand equality related to their own individual rights they were not being able to make a successful case. So um, I guess my message on this one in terms of what has made a difference in Canada well the law and the wording, the semantics was critical so that we could ensure that case by case, women were able to go forward and be guaranteed um, their equality under the, under the law. Where we thought was so important is that the equality under the law had to be equal in the substance of the law and where the content of the law is equal and fair to everyone so that everyone experiences the same result. And this then got into this whole context, which continued to be debated into the 1970s in Canada, uh, or around the creation uh, during the 1970s, um, which was, well, isn't treating everybody exactly the same, guaranteeing that there, there's equality of treatment? Well, of course, no. 
uh, particularly when it comes to women, because um, there are various aspects of gender that make us different. Um, and that means that often the treating everybody in exactly the same way has an unequal impact. So again, the Canadian Human Rights Act was written to try to resolve part of that debate. Um, and so the law, you know, in many countries that I have been um, posted to, they always say to me, well, we have laws around those things. The, the important aspect of it is in the detail. And then the next step is they have to have cases before the courts. It has to be defined case law by case law. So you have to have brave, courageous women that are prepared to come forward and fight these fights. And some of them are lengthy, and of course they're incredibly expensive. And let me tell you, from my very small experience of being part of a mobilization to try to um, advocate for women's rights, it's ugly out there. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of uh, opposition to some of these concepts from very odd perspectives and the women who are prepared to step forward and be prepared to work for gender equality and the issues around that have to be prepared for that, that sort of reaction to it. Um, often there is a, a sense that it's threatening people. Um, often there's a, a tendency to try to diminish it. Um, you know, terminology, I would say, is also, the language is something that we sort of fought the battle on. Um, uh, the term feminist, oh no, 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 <laughs> I'm, uh, I, I'm not a feminist. Well, do you believe that women and men should have equal rights? Absolutely, but I'm not a feminist. Um, because of this association of what that might mean. Um, these, uh, this sort of effort to diminish or this effort to sort of push back on these concepts that are critical to equality of women are very important. Gender equality, even in itself, um, is a very um, confrontational and contentious term in, uh, in many countries that I have worked in. And I've even had uh, some pretty strong discussions here in the Czech Republic about that particular term, gender equality. No, 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 no. In the 1980s in Canada, we used to say, and it's, we stole, I think, from the comedian Woody Allen, but we used to say that it was this concept that I don't want to be a member of a club that would accept me as a member. And so, no, 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 don't associate with me with gender equality because I got my job because of my ability, not because I'm a woman. So I don't believe that we have to talk about gender equality as if somehow that sort of diminishes whether or not we women actually are um, uh, as capable and as able to perform as, as men are. So I think I would challenge you and exhort you in the work that you're doing to be conscious of the language, and um, I think it's important that we continue to speak it. So what has made a difference in Canada recently? Well, our Prime Minister happens to be a man, but very strongly and forcefully and vocally is a feminist. I think that's been shocking even in the 2000s in Canada for many of our citizens to think about him defining himself as a feminist. At the recent G7 meeting, which was hosted by Canada, didn't quite go the way we wanted, but uh, uh, the uh, people who represent the leaders of the countries are called Sherpas. And these are the individuals who actually do the negotiating and then they bring the leaders in at the end to sign. Um, our Sherpa, uh, asked, required, all of the other Sherpas to take uh, an online course related to gender equality before um, they, they became involved in these discussions because gender equality was one of our priorities at the most recent G7. Well, that was kind of controversial to some of these <laughs> Sherpas, um, but I think these are the things that having the head of our state being a feminist have helped push things forward. And of course, he has that very famous quote from the 2015 moment that he appointed his cabinet, which was 50% women, and when the press asked him at the press conference, why do you have a cabinet of 50% women, he said, because it's 2015. And that was all he said. So rather than try to defend it on any rational basis, it was simply so obvious um, that there should be as many women in cabinet as there are men. 
Um, this aspect of um, treating everybody the same, I just want to make a, a state a couple of anecdotes on this. One is related to that in the sense of um, the, the concept that if we treat people the same, we don't treat them equally. And I encourage you to look for examples when you're discussing things in, in your work and in, in your, in your um, uh, the things that you do. Um, you know, the, the issues that we were involved in is in um, the fact that women give birth. It might mean that we, you know, should be allowed to have some paid maternity leave and time away from work um, that perhaps is not as critical for men. Um, you know, uh, privacy to change. There are many professions that, uh, yes, we'll let women in, but they're going to have to change into their uniforms in the locker room with the guys because we treat everybody the same. Um, those kind of silly debates hopefully have law, uh, largely been resolved, but they still continue. Um, equal pay for equal work. Well, again, we got down to semantics. Research assistants were paid more than librarians. The women were all librarians. The men were the research assistants. They were doing equal work. Um, cleaners were women. Janitors were men. The men got paid more money. Uh, post office, the women were clerks, the men were doing important work like taking the envelopes and putting them in the holes for where they're, that was back in the day, in those holes, the men got paid more money. Well, the law is important. Canadian Human Rights Act guaranteed equal pay for equal work, not exactly the same. So the Canada Post Union took the government to court. 30 years later, they won the case. So again, this is back to how long and how hard sometimes women have to fight to be guaranteed gender equality. Uh, systemic problems. Police officers had to be 180 centimeters to be a police officer. Well, I'm 180 centimeters, but I dare say I'm maybe one or two other women in the room are 180 centimeters. So clearly we couldn't be police officers. That would not be possible. Um, uh, but you know, that was equal. Everybody has to be 180 centimeters. What's the problem? Firefighters, well, women couldn't possibly haul those heavy hoses. Uh, well, they just brought in a, um, a physical test to determine that. Um, pilots, oh, we wouldn't want women, you know, they have to fly and stay in hotel rooms by themselves, and that might be dangerous for them. The same argument, by the way, was applied in the Foreign Service, and I'll maybe stop on that because I know we only have a very brief moment. Um, it's a cultural shift, gender equality. It's, it's, it's a, not only it's a legal concept, but it's a cultural shift. It's a, it's a language shift. It's, it's, a, it's a change in the way you think about things. So Foreign Service, um, when I was thinking about joining the service when I was a young woman in university, they sent out all male recruiters um, to talk to us about joining the Foreign Service. Um, I kind of went to the session and thought, well, I uh, can't see myself in that role because of the way they were presenting it and it seemed to be a very guy type thing and they do difficult work and they're out there in difficult parts of the world. So, um, so you know, there was a little bit of a cultural shift and women started to join the Foreign Service. However, if we married, we had to leave the Foreign Service. Not the men, but the women. Until 1975. That's not that long ago. Um, then we had to deal with our posting assignment people who tell us where we're going to go for our next assignment, who decided for us, for the women, where we could go in the world that would be safe for us. Because, you know, how could you possibly manage in these dangerous parts of the world, my dear? Um, so we'll post you to the safe parts of the world. Um, and so through the years, we have managed to overcome each of these sort of discriminatory uh, cultural concepts. Now our Prime Minister again has said, since he was Prime Minister, there will be 50% female ambassadors, period. Enough of this debate. Women have been in the Foreign Service since the 1950s. Why shouldn't there be as many women ambassadors as men? We're not quite there, by the way, but we're in the 40s, and I think we're, uh, in terms of world statistics, I think Canada has more women ambassadors at this moment than any other country. Um, but that's 2015. 
that that started. I've been an ambassador three times. The first time there were about 14% female ambassadors. The next time there was, oh, we were up to 18%. Uh, so now we're in the 40s. So that, uh, that's a big breakthrough. So I think I'll, I'll stop on that point. I, I just, um, you know, I'm old enough to know how important this work is. Uh, I'm old enough to have been affected by it. I'm old enough to have faced all the discrimination against women in so many aspects of my work and my career. Um, I've been dismissed. Uh, I've been sort of figuratively patted on the head. Um, I've been ignored. I've been mansplained. You know, we talk about this in North America. You sit in a meeting, you say something, and then the man says exactly the same thing and, you know, explains it to everybody. Or, or you know, you have, the you have the academic expert in a field and then the guy who read a book or read three things about it, you know, tries to tell the group, really? Uh, what? So I've experienced all that and so I know how important this is. And I know how important it is not only for everybody in this room, but for all those little girls out there who have just as much right as the little boys to decide to be or do or have the life, whatever they may choose to. So thank you for the work you're doing in this area. I think it's critically important. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, and if I can ask you, Ambassador, um, I would ask Guru to give your idea of Austria. Thank you. So, uh, thank you for inviting me uh, here today. Uh, I would like to uh, present, uh, before I go into the two points that I would like to stress uh, on uh, what Austria is uh, doing specifically in this area, I would like to line out some uh, landmarks for gender equality in Austria. <coughs> throughout the last hundred years, uh, also to show the long way that we have uh, come. In 1918, uh, the general suffrage was uh, introduced. In 1975, there was a reform of the family laws uh, by which uh, abortion was decriminalized uh, within the first three months of pregnancy. In 1989, there was an important reform of criminal law um, where rape and sexual assault uh, were criminalized also between married couples. Uh, in 1993, uh, the Equal Treatment Act entered into force. Uh, it bans uh, the discrimination and sexual and other harassment in the workplace. 1997 was important for uh, uh, the fact that 665,000 people signed the petition for equal payment for equal work. And now I'd like to come to the two um, measures that have take, been taken more recently and uh, that I also have been asked uh, from Vienna to, to point out uh, in front of this audience. Uh, both have to do with countering violence against women. 19% of violence within uh, family and social surroundings, 19% uh, of the violence uh, happens within the family and social surroundings. And there is a high number of unreported cases. So the first um, point I would like to, to make is the Protection Against Violence Act. This act is in force since 1997 with a major revision in uh, 2009, and it provides for the victims of domestic violence to be able to, to stay in their homes while the violent partner has to leave. In this sense, uh, police can ev evict a violent person from a domicile shared with the victim of the violence and issue a, a two weeks barring order. And since 2013, um, there was an amendment to the law that bar barring order can also include schools, kindergartens, uh, if the victims of the violence is a child. Uh, if the barring order is repeatedly violated, the endangering person can be detained. And independent of this police action, a court can, upon requests from a victim, victim issue an interim injunction barring the violent perpetrator from the shared domicile for a longer period, banning the endangering uh, person from the domicile and immediate surroundings and possibly from other certain places and from contacting the endangered person. So this Protection Against Violence Act is uh, one of the two items that I wanted to present and the second is uh, court 
process support. Victims of violence and their close relatives um, have a right to a cost-free psychosocial and judicial court pro process support. In this sense, uh, this includes counseling before legal action uh, and uh, support throughout the lawsuit until its uh, legally valid end. Uh, this uh, support includes the preparation of the uh, victim for the lawsuit and possible distress linked to it, then an information about proceedings and possible consequences of legal action, a personal accompaniment to the appointments with uh, police in co and in court, and the coordination with further authorities and institutions such as schools, hospitals, child or youth services. This uh, court process uh, support is uh, provided by victim organizations uh, and these uh, victim organizations have to have a contract with the Federal Ministry of Justice. And in the moment, uh, there are around 160 such organizations listed and a number of them specialize on children and youth. So that would be my presentation of the two main points that I wanted to make. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And, uh, hi, my name is Fatim Diarra. I'm a city councillor of Helsinki City, so the capital of Finland. Yay, capitals. Nice to be here in Prague. And I have to warn you, I'm a politician, so, so my, what I will say is also political. So you can kind of censor it a bit in your mind, so you don't kind of, don't believe everything I say, although it is of course the truth, but I'm a politician, so I have to warn you. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Finnish uh, Green Women's Movement. And, uh, and why this Finnish, Finnish uh, women's movement exists is because all the different political parties in Finland, they need to have a women's movement inside them. And all the different political parties get extra funding to have a women's movement inside them. So even the conservatives and uh, uh, really populist parties have a women's movement, which makes the conversation quite dif different because then you know that even the most conservatives, they have to form opinions in defending women's rights. And I have a long background in student politics, and, um, and I'm really happy to speak about this topic, but, but kind of it's a bit difficult for me because I'm Finnish. And, and when Finland just got, uh, last year we won the World Happiness Index, and everyone was kind of like, no, we're not that good at anything. <laughs> like, we're, we're not really that good, and we're really just a small country somewhere. So I'm trying to be, so I'm trying to tell good examples, but since I'm a Finn, it's really difficult to brag about our country. But well, in any ways, let's uh, go ahead. Um, people consider Finland to be a really, really uh, equal, equal country, and in a way it is true. We have a l l strong welfare state system where kind of everyone can participate. And, and the two things I would like to raise up, the first thing is uh, the subjective right to health, to child care. Meaning that every single person has the right for child care, no matter what is your level of income. And this basically means that women are freed uh, from only staying at home. And now the discussion has changed into not just childcare, but early childhood education. We don't anymore discuss that, oh, children, women, women will put their child, children to childcare, but we say that we will put our children to uh, early childhood education. And we have this goal, we want to be better than, better than the Danes. Since in Finland, uh, yeah, we want to beat you in this. Since in Finland, we, we normally put our children to daycare when they're three years old. And we see this as a huge problem because then it's often the women who stay home with the children and the men who could also stay home, but they somehow miraculously always choose to go to work. And it's the wife or the, or the spouse who stays at home. So what we're now fighting for is the six plus six plus six model, meaning that one parent will stay home six months, the other parent will stay home six months, and then the rest of six months can be shared between any, any parent or grandparent. And when I'm speaking about parents, I'm, I'm speaking about all kind of different parents, since we know that there's many different kind of forms of families, not only men and women, there's gay families, and there's rainbow families, and there's families where there's three parents or other different kind of families. So we need to build a system where all these different kind of variations are, are taken in, in consideration. 
Um, also, something that is really positive is the fact that we have free education starting from uh, child, early childhood into university, into your, your doctorate. Meaning that no matter how poor you are, you can put your children to childcare and you can go to university, you can do your master's, you can do your PhD. So I think these kind of tools are something that, is, that are pushing for, for equality. And then something else, the, my second point is the strong legislative support, meaning that we have strong laws. We have strong laws that support the right of women and of all the different sexes, since sex is, of course, not a binary thing, but there's many different kind of variations that we need to respect that. On 1987, there was the first act on equality between men and women. And, and I'm born in 1986, so basically I've always been living my whole life in, in Finland where there is this, this law has been, been active. And this law was, was, was really, really good, and, and it, was, it was good, but then we, in some point we noticed that this is actually not good enough. It's not good enough to speak about equality between men and women. So in 2014, a new act, Act on Equality, uh, came, to, came to its force. And in this act, all the, this act is a law of equality for all the different genders, sexes, uh, races, and, and different kind of, um, um, a different kind of like, um, how do you say it? Um, yeah, like basically the whole package. No matter who you are, you're supported. It really doesn't matter what you have down there or up here, you need to have the same, same rights. <laughs> Let's put it like this. I'm, I'm like this crazy black feminist from Finland, so I can speak like this. I think it's quite okay. Yeah, so basically this new law came to act and it's been really good because then we created the system of ombudsman, meaning that there's this office for the protections of people's rights. And if you see that your rights have been uh, mistreated in, in, in your workplace, in, in education, wherever, you can do a complaint to this office and then this is quite a big office and then they will, they will uh, search this issue and they, then they will do the needed uh, legal, legal action that are needed to be taken. So we have really, really strong legislative support there and it protects all the different genders and sexes. And now uh, we just got a new law, it, it, it just passed a few months ago, and it's a new law on early childhood education and something that we're actually super proud of. And, and you have to remember, we, have a, we, we are not in the government, the Greens are not in the government, the Social Democrats are not in the government. In the government, there's now the Conservative Party, the Center Party, and, and then this um, semi um, blue Finnish, which are blue Finnish party, which is kind of really nationalist, semi populist party. And they passed this new law uh, on early childhood education. And in this early childhood education, in the law is written that the early childhood education must be gender sensitive. Meaning that in our early childhood education, meaning these small, small little kids, you can't anymore say that, oh, boys will do this and girls will do this. And OK, boys, let's go and play with the balls and girls, let's go be little princesses. But the whole education needs to be gender sensitive. This does not mean that boys are not allowed to play with balls or the girls are not allowed to, play, to pretend to be princesses. It just means that in the system, we don't put any kind of hats on their head and force them to be something, but we actually give the children the right to choose and the right to be whoever they are and support them in their growth. And uh, yeah, so why is equality so important? My why is economy. Finland is a really, really small country, somewhere up there where it's cold, and uh, we have only 5.4 uh, million inhabitants, and in the city of Helsinki area, we have 1 million inhabitants, meaning that we're quite of a small place. And, and if, we don't, if we don't let every single person kind of give everything they have to the benefit of the nation, how will we survive? We speak this weird language that no one understands, and even our nice Scandinavian colleagues who all speak this uh, language that they can understand, but we have this small little language somewhere up there. So we kind of, we need to be best at almost everything to survive, and we're doing quite well. And the reason why we're doing quite well is because we give every single person the opportunity to participate. And this means that we need to liberate women from their homes. And we need to make sure that every single person, no matter what their gender or sex is, uh, that they can participate and that they can go as far in the society as possible. Yep. But still, we're not there yet. Because I'm a Finn, I have to say how bad we, badly we suck in the end. Because we're not a perfect country, no, not, not at all. Uh, something that we're really good at is equality, but something that we're actually failing in is equity. In Finland, we have this idea that we believe that we make one system, it's a really good system, and we can measure this system, and now everyone is, is, is in this one system. Yay! That is not true. 
we have to do we have to do equity. We do equality, but we don't do equity. So basically, what we have to do we have to we have to see how we can actually uh, change our system so it so it fits more people. World is getting more di diverse. People's needs, people's desires are getting more diverse. This means that we have to have to go through our system. And then something a huge fight that is now going on in Finland is the fight on the military service. We still have a mandatory military service and it's only for men, meaning that all young men will have to go to military service for one year and women don't. This is a huge equality issue and this is big for the feminist movement and this is also big for, the, for most of the political parties. We need to find a solution for this since it is, it is 2018 and we can't have a system where only men supposedly protect the country and what do women then do? Give birth? So basically we still have many big battles going on but I think we're going to win them since um, uh, all the political parties, they state that they're in some way feminist and the two, two candidates for our, our, our prime minister in the next year's elections, uh, they both have already stated that they're feminist. And if someone would be, uh, I, I think a person who would say that they're not a feminist, they would not win the election. Thank you. It just doesn't work. Oh, it does. Uh, thank you very much. Um, for our last speaker, we have Silvia Prubanova, who is the director of Institute of Labor and Family Research from Slovakia. Uh, she's going to be speaking Slovak, so those of you, I bet we don't have translation from Slovak to Czech, so um, you can take off your headphones, those who have them. Uh, this is going to be the last presentation, then we have a few questions um, from me, I guess, or from the audience. Thank you. Dobrý deň, ďakujem za pozvanie, ďakujem za príležitosť vystúpiť a aj vystúpiť v Slovenčine, pretože ešte som si nezvykla, že som zo zahraničia. Takže ak máme nový hodcov, nové menšiny, tak možno môžeme zaviesť v rámci podpory diverzity aj termín nové zahraničie, to budeme my. Budem trošku uvoľnenejšia, keď budem môcť hovoriť v českom prostredí po slovensky, tak a hneď idem teda k prezentácii dvoch konkrétnych dobrých praxí. O tú prvú ma požiadal Radan Šafařík z úradu vlády. Uh, nie je to celkom moja šálka kávy ako neprávničky, a, ale je to otázka príspevku náhradného výživného, ktorá je údajne v Českej republike takým uh, evergreenom. A Slovenská republika od roku 2012 tento príspevok má a od 1. júla tohto roku vstupuje do platnosti novela tohto, novela tohto poskytovania, novela zákona. Takže pár slov k príspevku o náhradnom výživnom. Príspevok je určený samozrejme nezaopatrenému dieťaťu a podmienkami na jeho získanie sú je neplnenie vyživovacej povinnosti zo strany rodiča po, najme, po dobu najmenej troch mesiacov alebo prebiehajúce exekučné konanie voči rodičovi, ktorý výživné neplatí. Oprávnená osoba, čo sú v 99% prípadoch matky, môže návrh na exekúciu podať už pri prvom nezaplatenom výživnom. Úrad práce môže vyplatiť náhradné výživné aj za predchádzajúce mesiace, ako ho rodič požiada. Uh, náhradné výživné je tak preventívnym krokom, ktorého cieľom je predísť stavu hmotnej núze detí, ktoré sa nachádzajú v riziku chudoby, ako aj u detí, ktorým nevznikol nárok na sírodský dôchodok. Nárok, nárok na náhradné výživné zaniká, ak sa obnoví vyživovacia povinnosť a táto trvá po dobu najmenej troch mesiacom spôsobom, spôsobom ktorý určí súd. Pokiaľ ide o tú novelu, od 1. júla tohto roku, teda od 1. července, bude príspevok poskytovaný na základe schválenej novely zákona, ktorá zabezpečuje navrátenie vyplateného príspevku náhradného výživného v prípade, ak osoba dodatočne výživné zaplatí, alebo ak sa v exekučnom konaní výživné vymôže. Novela zákona bližšie stanovuje povinnosti, časové obdobie a výšku príspevku náhradného výživného, ktoré je potrebné vrátiť. Spresňuje aj podmienky nároku, ak rodič vymáha výživné z cudziny, alebo ak je dieťa umiestnené vo výchovnom zariadení, alebo nebodaj vo výkone väzby. Asi viete, že na Slovensku je trestnoprávna zodpovednosť do 14 rokov, takže môže nastať aj takáto situácia. Novela reaguje aj na potrebu neprehliadať na príjem dieťaťa, ak je toto v inej starostlivosti ako rodičov, a jej cieľom je odbúrať administratívnu náročnosť, urýchliť poskytnutie príspevku a zabezpečiť rovnaké poskytnutie aj cudzincom s doplnkovou ochranou. Na výplatu náhradného výživného boli v roku 2017 vynaložené prostriedky v sume 7 miliónov eur, čo je pokles oproti predchádzajúcemu roku o 927 tisíc eur. 
Priemere, priemerný mesačný počet poberateľov od toho roku 2012 kulminuje oko dva, okolo 20 tisíc, v roku 2016 to bolo 18 300. Maximálna výška náhradného výživného pre nezaopatrené dieťa je 1,2 násobok životného minima. Oproti predchádzajúcemu roku sa ani v roku 2017 táto suma nezvýšila a bola 108,50 centov. Toľko k tejto povinnej jazde k náhradnému výživnému. A druhé opatrenie, ktoré by som chcela predstaviť, je z dielne Ministerstva práce, sociálnych vecí a rodiny, ktoré aktivity prezentovala predo mnou už pani Pietruchová. Je to konštituovanie národ, alebo zriadenie národnej linky pre ženy, ktoré zažívajú násilie. Slovensko ako 9. krajina Európskej únie v roku 2015 do februári zriadila túto národnú linku podľa kritérií Rady Európy a pri splnení minimálnych štandardov. To znamená, že linka je, funguje 24 hodín denne, 7 dní v týždni, 365 dní v roku. Je to vlastne základné poradenstvo a základná krízová intervencia. Toto poradenstvo v nepretržitej prevádzke poskytuje v súčasnosti 7 poradky. Ich kompetencia a vzdelanie sú predovšetkým psychologické, sociálnu prácu a sociálne poradenstvo majú vyštudované. Po celé 3 roky fungovania vlastne neustále je im poskytované ďalšie dodatočné vzdelávanie podľa konkrétnych potrieb, ktoré indikujú. Samozrejme aj supervízia, keďže ide o sociálnu službu, mentoring a podobne. Treba povedať, že, a ešte som asi nespomenula, že samozrejme linka je bezplatná, anonimná, všetky informácie sú prísne, prísne diskrétne alebo tajné. Od začiatku poskytovania tejto služby, teda od roku, od februára 2015 do februára 2018, kedy sme sčítavali, teda robili sme závery za trojročné obdobie, mali vyše 6 tisíc hovorov od žien, ktoré zažívajú násilie. Teda cieľová skupina sú ženy zažívajúce násilie. Treba povedať, že od začiatku linky sa nám indikuje aj potreba špeciálnej linky pre, pre všetkým starších ľudí, ktorí zažívajú násilie, ktoré nie sú síce cieľovou skupinou, ale samozrejme základné poradenstvo je im poskytnuté. A pomerne nie zanedbateľné percento, aj takých 5-7 tvoria hovorí od mužov, ktorí zažívajú násilie. Čiže aj možno toto je jedna indícia smerom k tomu, že aj špecializované služby pre mužov, nielen ako páchateľov, ale aj ako obete násilia, budú potrebné aj v tomto našom konzervatívnejšom priestore, ako ste ho nazvali. Samozrejme, pokiaľ ide o tie formy násilia, predovšetkým sú, je to psychické násilie, ktoré je kombinované s fyzickým, sexuálnym, ekonomickým a sociálnym vo všetkých tých svojich nekonečných formách a manifestáciách, ktoré poznáme. Možno by som ešte spomenula na záver, že veľkou výhodou je aj systém, nie je to volanie cez mobilný telefón ani cez pevnú linku, je to volanie cez špeciálny počítačový systém, ktorý nám umožňuje generovať tie hovory a umožňuje nám vlastne získavať informácie, pokiaľ ich teda ženy poskytnú. A tieto dáta, ktoré nám ženy dobrovoľne teda odovzdajú o svojej situácii, nám umožňujú jednak samozrejme spoluprácu s prezidiom policajného zboru, ale predovšetkým nám slúžia ako podklad preto, aby sme údaje o domácom násilí a radovo podmenenom násilí nečerpali len z dojmov a odhadov, ale čerpali ich naozaj z praxe od, priamo od obeti. Takže toľko za mňa. Ďakujem pekne. Thank you very much. Now we have a few minutes for a discussion, so I'd like to ask all of you a question. Please. First, before you start answering, please, you can take the microphone to your hands and you need to speak to the microphone because, uh, so we can translate it. Um, so I have um, um, questions um, for Professor Christensen and you, you spoke about the role of civil society, but um, do you think that the civil society here in the Czech Republic can play a similar role to the civil society in Denmark? If it's because, well, there's probably a bit different cultural context, so what can be the role for civil society? I'll first ask all the questions so you can think of it and then I'll, I'll let you answer. For our two ambassadors, what's your personal experience with gender equality here in the Czech Republic? And or what do you think that we can learn that from your countries? Um, and uh, for, 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 you, for you two, um, um, what is... Um, Like, you spoke about the way forward, um, you, you told us about equity and you told us about um, some other possibilities, but um, do you see it happening here as well or would you advise us something that would be, let's say, uh, maybe, I, I don't know, like, probably not as, as, as 
forward as, as, as in your country, um, which is probably a bit, you know, forward. As from what you said, well, it seemed like you're doing much better on the gender equality than we are from all the statistics you can see it as well. And maybe for, for you, um, if there is any, the difference between Czech and Slovak Republic, if there's something that we can like build up on, since these countries are somewhat similar, so if there's really some sort of coordination happening, if there's cooperation, or if there's any practical way how we can uh, learn from the experience. So I guess we can start with Professor Christensen and go from there to here. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry just to mention it, but you have like two to three minutes for each of the answers. So please stick to it so we can all have lunch. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, this is working now. Thank you for your very um, tough questions here because civil society, what's that? And um, of course one can um, get the impression of civil society as always progressive. And uh, we all know that this is not the case right now. And I mean, it, it's also the paradoxes of democracy somehow that you have to listen to what's going on uh, out there. But um, uh, I would say that uh, I think it's very important then from a civil society feminist point of view to keep um, open on the avenues, uh, so to speak. Uh, to even though things look uh, very depressing, and they do in Denmark um, also right now, we have a standstill in terms of, uh, of um, reforms uh, for gender equality, paternity leave, and all that. Um, but to be prepared, to be prepared, because we know from history that all of a sudden uh, a policy window might open. And I mean, uh, looking back in history, in the Western world that the 1960s and 70s where all, all the new feminist movements came around, nobody could uh, have foreseen that in the 1950s which were cold and conservative and what do I know? So, I mean, one can hope for a reaction also to uh, conservative uh, uh, ideas. And I think that one um, uh, important uh, experience from uh, Denmark and perhaps the Nordic area is the building of coalitions. That we, things have worked best when, uh, when all the political parties, when it comes to government policy, to, when they work together. Uh, and uh, this is very, ha has been very much dependent also on uh, conservative feminists. I mean, conservative feminists were the ones who started the women's movement. I mean, don't forget that. So uh, I think it's really, really important to keep these networks going and to keep conversations going because many, even conservative women, they are also today highly educated. They face the same problems as uh, many who would call themselves uh, feminists. I'm not so keen on the words feminist or, or not feminist and, and sometimes I, I I think in, when I, I teach, uh, I always talk about gender and gender studies, but I mean, that's how, how you feel. Uh, and I don't think the words are the most important. Uh, the most important is the content and what's behind the words. Yeah. Thank you very much. Ambassador, please. So the question was related to civil society also? Uh, no, no, the question for you was regarding your experience with gender equality here in Czech Republic and possibly lessons for us. Uh, well. Uh, being a diplomat from another country, I wouldn't even begin to suggest any lessons for this country. Uh, but uh, it is always extremely interesting to move, and this is why I have the career that I have, and to live in different cultures and to learn from those cultures and to um, experience them. Um, I, there are aspects of my experience here that I feel a little bit um, are like uh, uh, things that, uh, conversations and issues that I was talking about in debating uh, when I was back in Canada, but maybe two decades ago. Um, there are other sides that seem extremely progressive here in the Czech Republic. For example, um, the fact that uh, women can take uh, lengthy maternity leaves, paid maternity leaves, and so on. Um, and yet there's the other side to it that I also hear being a manager at work here, where three years and then they have another child in six years and another child nine years out of the workforce, that's really a significant mm. issue for the return to the workplace. And when I speak to Czech men often, they will say, well, that's the woman's choice. She, she, she wants to stay home for nine years. Um, well, does she have options in terms of an access to childcare and how does society view her if she chooses to return to work and so on? So um, my experience here has been um, that uh, it reinforces in me 
um, that the issues that women are dealing with are global. It reinforces for me that we may speak a slightly different language, but we are all um, dealing with um, challenges that are very similar. Um, it reinforces to me the importance of working together to address those challenges. And um, today's philosophy, and in some parts of the world, we seem to be um, taking another course, which is, you know, independence, and uh, we're all look out for our own interests. And uh, my view, the Canadian government view, is that we continue to reach out, work together, and find common ground. And I think that's the uh, that's the way forward. Thank you very much. Um, well, as Her Excellency the Canadian Ambassador already mentioned, uh, it's also not my task to give advice to to, to the Czech Republic. Uh, so I don't I don't want to um, comment uh, the what what Czech Republic is doing uh, in the in the field of gender equality. But I would also only like to uh, mention that uh, between our two countries, being Central European countries. Uh, we share much in common in our culture, in our history, in our economic ties, uh, and uh, uh, I think we have a very good um, level and a uh, uh, good level of discussion uh, between both countries. You see this in many areas, not related to gender equality, but I could well imagine that also in the area of gender equality we can learn from each other. So um, I don't see uh, too many differences in culture. Thank you. Thank you. I, as a Finn, I don't dare to tell you guys what to do. <laughs> but, 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 um, and then since I also know that I used, I used to work before in the, in the student movement, and uh, I was um, a policy officer there in the student movement, and we cooperated a lot with the Czech student movement. And I know that in, in the Czech student movement, there's a bunch of people who are working hard and who are in their soul feminist and white, fighting for good stuff. So basically, I know that the work is, is already happening here in Czech Republic. So there's basically nothing I could tell you guys. But something that I have actually have to say I agree with is the fact that also the conservatives, they need to be taken into the battle uh, towards equality because uh, then when you have a wider perspective of the world fighting with you, the results are better. And, and, and some, another argument which is really good is the argument of economy. If you want your economy to grow, you need everyone working and you need everyone participating. So if you want to kind of deny your country the opportunity to actually become something great, okay, well then, don't, don't go for equality. But if you actually want to uh, build your country and make it something fantastic and great, then you need equality. Thank you. Thank you. I think that between the reality of the Czech and Slovak Republic is a less difference than we sometimes talk about. Uh, najmä pre nás ako stále platí, že tá Česká republika je istým referenčným bodom. Hej. Veľmi radi sa mimovládne organizácie, verejnosť, ale aj politici v, odvolávajú na nejaké opatrenie, ktoré funguje. Ak funguje v Českej republike, tak je dobré aj pre nás. To je dobré. A čo máme spoločné ešte, je to prá práve tá difúznosť politickej scény, to, že sa ťažko dopracujeme k nejakému konsensu a politickej podpore e, pre rodovú rovnosť, či už v Českej republike alebo v Slovenskej republike. Uh, takže asi musíme sa spoločne zamyslieť nad tým, že tá zmena musí prísť jednoducho z dola a musí byť štruktúrálna a nemôže to byť len otázka také individuálnej zodpovednosti a individuálnej angažovanosti tých, ktorí presviečajú presvedčených. To je asi taká, taký ten základný leitmotiv, ktorý máme my, ktorí sa tejto agende venujeme roky, že je to jeden krok dozadu, jeden krok dopredu a dva kroky dozadu už možno 20 rokov, takže m, asi ide o to, ako tlačiť na to, keď sa nevieme dopracovať k politickému konsensu podpory rodovej rovnosti, rovnosti príležitosti, ako na to ísť. Stále si myslím, že máme viac toho spoločného a môžeme sa navzájom inšpirovať. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I know I said in the beginning that we should have some questions uh, from the audience, but I'm afraid we don't have time for that because the time limits are strict and we need to continue on with the discussion. So I'm pretty sure that some of our, some of our guests will join us for lunch so you can talk to them um, in person. I would like to thank everyone for coming here. Um, it's, I think it's been a fruitful discussion that we all enjoyed. So um, thank you very much. Thank you.